we're grateful to be here with you this evening. Terry first invited us to come here to speak in 2019, but COVID derailed that plan repeatedly. I'm especially sad that we didn't have the chance to meet Sister Rosemary Flanagan, for whom this lecture is named, especially since she was still living here in Kansas back then. Sister Rosemary sounds like the kind of person I would have loved. Direct, caring, twinkly-eyed, opinionated, incredibly able. And Sister Rosemary, if you're watching online, we send you our warmest regards. In an interview about her many years working at the Center for Practical Bioethics, Sister Rosemary said something that really struck me. And I quote, I cannot imagine having a better job in the whole world than teaching ethics to adults who actually want to learn. That certainly resonates with us. We believe that our best shot at inspiring real long-term change is to engage with those who care and want to learn, like all of you. Well, it may have taken us four years to get here, but... Hold on. Our... But one bonus for us um, <clears throat> has been getting to know Terry, who stuck with it and stayed in touch with us all along, and then has done a great job of hosting us the last couple days, and I feel like we've made a friend, and uh, it's very welcome. <clears throat> While Terry and many of you may be bioethicists, we are not. We're here as people who are steeped in ethical issues that our fam because our family has not received patient-centered medical care. The title of tonight's talk hints at the dilemma we all face as patients. We hear a lot these days from hospitals and providers about patient-centered care, which suggests that providers are paying attention to their patients' needs above all else. But if those providers can hear all their patients, yet choose not to listen, what then? Sparkly-eyed and luminous, our daughter, Talia Goldenberg, died nine years ago at the age of 23 from preventable medical errors. Hers is a complex story of how everything can go wrong unless someone, anyone, on a medical team is willing to do the right thing and just listen. But please bear in mind that for us, this isn't a story. It's our reality that our daughter was killed in a supposedly safe space. It's also about what it means to carry on when a hospital and providers injure egregiously then refuse to bear responsibility for their actions. Talia is not just a statistic. With her cheerful disposition, discerning mind, and irrepressible spirit, she was a person who, like you, lived and laughed, played and pursued, and was beloved to many. Talia was born a little over a year after her sister, Raya. Because they were so close in age, they grew up doing everything together from pooping in the potty to learning to read. They shared a closeness Talia's whole life, even though they looked at the world very differently. I never tire of telling the story that while Raya was getting ready for bed one night and already a deep thinker, she asked, well, if God created the world, then who created God? And four-year-old Talia, without missing a beat, and with reverence matching her sisters, said, yeah, and where does the water go when you flush the toilet? <laughs> Talia paid attention to how things work, whether it was the nuances of relationships or anatomy and body mechanics, which later formed the basis for much of her art. Our Talia was a bundle of everything yummy. You felt good when you were with her. She was also articulate and self-aware, had definite opinions and voiced them, yet she wasn't judgmental. She had feelings and she voiced those too. When she was little and got upset with us, she'd write these long letters, sounding out words as she went, informing us in no uncertain terms how mad she was. But she'd always sign them, love Talia. Even from the youngest age, Talia stayed in her relationships when there was conflict. 
Regrettably, Talia's ability to communicate clearly and directly was not enough to protect her when she was a patient. Talia was energetic, physically fearless, athletically gifted. She was determined, open, affectionate, and the most creative person I've ever met. She was known everywhere for her work ethic, which she applied in all situations, whether it was rock climbing, slide tackling in soccer, pole vaulting, skiing in deep powder, linear algebra, art history, or creating art. She covered many miles across campus on crutches in Minnesota in January. She was tenacious. Talia was by nature intuitive, loyal, and ironically in the end, a consummate listener. Always a safe harbor for everyone. She had many friends of all ages and backgrounds. Being part of a growing family meant everything to Talia. She adored her adopted sisters and brother and had a special relationship with each of her siblings. Talia had Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome, EDS, a disease characterized by really stretchy connective tissue. And over time, ligaments get looser and can stretch to a point where they no longer stabilize the joints. In Talia's case, that meant full time in a knee brace, but she worked hard at not letting that slow her down, as you can see. Nevertheless, when muscles are forced to step in to do the work of ligaments, they don't do a very good job of holding the joints in place. So like many EDS patients, Talia ended up with more and more pain and instability around her joints. Although stretchy, loose connective tissue is a hallmark of EDS, the disease often involves multiple organ systems. And even EDS experts can't explain or predict all the symptoms, and much about the disease is just still coming to light now. And what all of this meant for Talia was that she saw a lot of doctors starting at about age 12 when symptoms came on with Aurora. As she matured, she became very adept at navigating the medical system, including dealing with appointments herself, making referrals, scheduling, dealing with insurance companies, all in addition to interacting with the physicians themselves. When Talia was in college, her sister Raya accompanied her to Mayo Clinic and was amazed at Talia's medical knowledge and her capacity to manage doctors who became defensive when they were unsure what was going on medically for Talia. Talia would ask questions and probe for answers nicely in sophisticated ways so that she wouldn't alienate the doctors or make them feel inadequate, all in an effort to get the best care for herself by tending to the needs of the doctor. Talia's art is a window into both who she was and how she felt in her EDS body. She entered Carleton College as a pre-med student, but pretty much became consumed with and was consumed by every art medium she encountered in classes there. And that included painting, marble sculpture, printmaking, bookbinding, and paper arts, metal sculpture, pen and ink mixed with watercolors. Friends tell stories of visiting with Talia at the art building on campus almost any time of day or night. After graduation, in spite of her worsening pain, and partly because of it, Talia produced an incredible amount of work. The most remarkable thing about Talia was that while she was often joyful and always engaged with those around her, she was able to address her pain, fears, and the dark despair of, illness, of life with chronic illness through her art. One physician friend, <clears throat> <laughs> One physician friend, when educating doctors about what life is like when dealing with chronic pain, simply puts up this photo to show how Talia looked on the outside, and this photo to show how she felt on the inside. Talia was able to express all sides of herself in her art. Through, depiction of, through depictions of her brokenness, 
Clay had demonstrated just how whole she was. Due to increasing instability in her neck, which left her experiencing near constant headaches and intractable neck pain, Clay traveled to EDS experts around the country, and their consensus was that the top four vertebrae in her neck could be fused to the base of her skull using plates and screws. Talia's surgery was to be done by a renowned neurosurgeon in Seattle at a regional referral center on February 10, 2014. We live 300 miles south of Seattle in Eugene, Oregon, and on the 9th, we headed through an ice storm that in the aftermath of Talia's death feels like it was a tempest straight out of a Shakespearean tragedy. That night, before beginning her Hippoclin's wash to clean her neck and in preparation for surgery, Talia removed her necklace, which she had made herself, and she secured it around my neck for safekeeping. This was our special ritual. This, I always wore her jewelry during her surgeries, returning it when she came home. But I never got to give this necklace back to Talia. Instead, it's remained here around my neck for the past nine years. Surgeries like the spinal fusion Talia had in 2014 come with risks, but the risks Talia signed off on were unrelated to those that killed her. Talia's doctors were not aware that they had dislocated her jaw in the operating room so that after surgery, her jaw was locked and her mouth could barely open. Her neck was now fused so it couldn't bend. Lying flat on her back and frightened, Talia was struggling to breathe due to a swollen airway that made her sound like Darth Vader. As a doctor, I knew she was in grave danger. And then she vomited twice while laying on her back, which made her a tremendous aspiration risk. With her fused neck and locked jaw, Talia would be nearly impossible to intubate if her airway occluded, which would mean she could die. I kept telling the staff that I was concerned Talia's airway would close and that she could not be intubated if that happened. Through clenched teeth, Talia kept repeating that she was having trouble breathing. We were alarmed and could not figure out why the hospital staff were not. Our increasing demands that something be done for Talia finally got the nurse to call the rapid response team, that designated group of hospital staff who are called to a bedside to evaluate a patient who's deteriorating or whose medical needs are not being controlled. The lead nurse on the team recommended that Talia be transferred to the ICU, but the respiratory therapist on the team, the person who deals with airways, argued pointedly against the idea, insisting that Talia's breathing was fine. It seemed like he was not gonna let a physician father tell him what was what. And the neurosurgical chief resident, who had just operated on Talia, agreed to send her to the ICU just to appease us, saying, I'd want the best for my daughter, too, and not because of Talia's physical symptoms and medical risks. For the first several hours after Talia arrived in the ICU, her nurse was appropriately coordinating her care, working with Talia, us, the ICU doctor, different respiratory therapist. Talia was being treated with IV steroids, aerosols, racemic epinephrine, all in an effort to dilate her airways and to treat what we assumed was swelling around her airway from the surgery itself. Knowing that we were gonna be taking care of Talia through many more days and weeks while she convalesced, Talia's nurse encouraged us to get a few hours of sleep. We were apprehensive but she promised to call us immediately if anything changed. And this was the neurosurgical ICU in a major referral center, and this nurse was so attentive. We assumed that the ICU would be prepared to take care of Talia if her condition deteriorated. We accepted the nurse's reassurance and advice, went up to our room around 2.30 a.m. to get a few hours sleep, only to discover the next morning that it had been false reassurance. That morning, I arrived at Talia's bedside, having just missed the 90-second interaction that was neurosurgical rounds. And Talia's words haunt me to this day. I wish you'd been here, Papa. They wouldn't listen to me. 
Talia went on to explain that she had told the neurosurgeon she was having more trouble breathing and asked him what was wrong with her jaw, why her mouth wouldn't open. He responded by saying that nothing he did could have affected her jaw and she would just have to see a jaw specialist after she left the hospital. <clears throat> then he signed orders to transfer her out of the ICU to the regular floor. He was in a rush that morning. He had a plane to catch. What the neurosurgeon did not do, but should have, was listen to Talia's concerns and then examine her. Next, he should have called an anesthesiologist to evaluate Talia's airway, a maxillofacial surgeon to look at her jaw. They could have tried intubating her through her nose, or they could have performed a non-emergency tracheostomy by making an incision in the front of her neck and placing a breathing tube there in a preventative manner to avoid the possibility of an emergency cricotherotomy, also known as a crike, later on. None of this happened. Shortly after missing the neurosurgical rounds, Naomi and I were with Talia when the ICU doctor conducted his rounds. But at the time, we had no idea he was Talia's ICU doctor. We hadn't met him, and he didn't introduce himself, and he didn't speak to or examine Talia. He was standing with some other people huddled around a computer in the doorway, making decisions about Talia's condition and treatment without Talia. Throughout the morning, we kept telling Talia's nurse that Talia was having difficulty breathing, asking for additional treatment and an evaluation. Hospital nurses are always in a tough position. On the one hand, they answer to the doctors, who write orders and are a level above them in the hierarchy. On the other hand, nurses are the patient's direct advocate. And Talia's nurse, on day one post-op, caught in a bind between the doctor's plans and Talia's needs, she chose not to listen to us and indeed told us literally that she was deferring to the doctors. And really, in that moment, we were truly abandoned, with Talia's advocate having decided not to advocate. A bit later, the nurse came in to report that the transfer out of the ICU and onto the regular floor was still a go. They were just waiting for a bed. Talia, but Talia was having more and more of a struggle just trying to breathe and could not breathe at all if she was on her back. She couldn't swallow water, couldn't open her mouth, and because of how much trouble she was having, she could not get out of bed. Incredulous, I asked how Talia could be transferred in this condition, but the nurse just shrugged. Later that morning, the speech pathologist, the single person in the whole story to have examined Talia, never indicated to us that she shared our concerns or recognized the danger Talia was in, yet, it turns out she actually recorded it all in the chart, noting exactly what we were seeing, that Talia couldn't breathe when she was lying on her back and couldn't open her mouth. This was the single person who carefully examined Talia's jaw and upper airway, and she could have saved Talia's life if she just grabbed one of the doctors or nurses and said, this patient is really in distress, I'm worried about her. Instead, she left the ICU without telling anyone <coughs> that Talia's situation was critical. Later, during a Washington State Department of Health investigation into these events, the speech pathologist was interviewed and asked why she didn't alert Talia's providers. Her response was that she did not feel comfortable contacting physicians. And she added she also assumed everybody knew anyways because it was so obvious. Talia's whole hospital experience was extremely troubling and confusing. We were essentially freaking out about Talia, and the hospital personnel did not seem to be. It's hard to describe what this experience is like, though gaslighting is the term that comes to mind. You're in a hospital with a lot of expertise, people who supposedly know the most about this type of surgery and the normal post-operative course. But our own expertise, Talia's of her body and experience, Naomi's as mom who'd seen Talia through major surgeries, mine as a father and a physician, was all being discounted, completely and utterly disregarded. Nobody would listen, and Talia's situation was becoming critical. We were very scared for Talia, 
and we were getting nowhere with all these providers. We found ourselves with no good options. And as a physician, I know how this works. If we became more insistent, louder, pushy, the ICU staff might label us as difficult, and that would make things a whole lot worse. They could take it out on Talia, and her care would be further compromised. It was a terrible place to be. Talia was deteriorating. We were powerless. So at a time when we should have been focusing only on caring for Talia, instead, we all were turning to people outside the hospital for medical advice and to solicit ideas about what to do for Talia's breathing, since we weren't getting any response from the staff in the hospital. In a bizarre moment, about an hour before disaster struck, Talia got her phone and was on the internet contacting an EDS neck group. I was in touch with a doctor friend, and Naomi was trying to reach a cousin who's a doctor, a pulmonologist. And that's an indication of just how abandoned we were by Talia's medical care team in the hospital. Later that morning, I had a heated discussion with the neuro ICU practitioner about whether, actually Jeff had a heated discussion with the neuro ICU practitioner about whether Talia's course was typical or not. The neurosurgical team who deal with patients who have surgeries like Talia's every day wanted Talia up and walking, which she was unable to do. They were transferring her to the regular ward when she was having more and more trouble breathing, and yet nobody seemed the least concerned. The ICU practitioner equivocated, but decided to give Talia a dose of IV Valium. As a medication that is often used to relax people, relieve anxiety, and help them sleep, Valium was only going to help Talia if muscle spasm was the issue, as opposed to a dislocated jaw and swollen airway. It seemed that the read on Talia was anxiety. She was just an anxious young woman with post-intubation irritation, and we were just her overprotective parents. Jeff tried to get the practitioner to understand that Talia's breathing trouble was not because she was anxious, but that she was becoming increasingly anxious because she was having so much trouble breathing. About an hour later, Talia's airway did occlude right in front of the ICU practitioner and with us by her side. Everything we'd been warning her providers about came to pass, and no provider was prepared to deal with Talia's airway emergency. Words cannot adequately describe what this was like. Talia was aware of everything that was going on. She sat bolt upright, at 1.27 p.m. with an urgency that made it clear things were very, very wrong. She coughed and called for the suction wand, which Jeff handed to her, but it didn't help. She coughed again, then cried out, I can't breathe, help me, I can't breathe. These would be the last words Talia ever spoke. She was frantic, her intense blue eyes bulged as she looked from me to Jeff pure terror on her face as she tried unsuccessfully to draw in air. Adrenaline was coursing through me, and I bolted out the door while Jeff stayed right there with Talia, telling her we were getting her help. She'd be okay. I shouted across to the nursing station, my daughter can't breathe. She needs help. I thought I was calling for the code team, so when the head nurse affirmed that she was calling for help, I assumed the code team was on its way. But who we got was the same respiratory therapist who had argued with Jeff the night before, the one who had insisted that Talia was fine. Up to this point, Talia had been on her side all night and day because she could not breathe when she rolled onto her back. But now the respiratory therapist placed a mask over her face and forced her down onto her back. Talia was trying desperately to rip the mask off her face. She thrashed like a person being strangled. It was unbearable to watch. It's still unbearable for me now, knowing the panic she felt being forced onto her back into the very position she'd avoided as a matter of survival for the last 18 hours. In these, her last conscious moments, Talia was bursting with the desperate need for air. She knew she was suffocating. She was aware 
that nobody was helping her, that she was going to die. And then she went still. Talia's mouth could not be opened because her jaw was locked and her neck was fused, making both ventilation and intubation impossible. I heard Jeff screaming at them, telling them it wouldn't work, that she needed a crike now. She needed an incision in her trachea to create an airway. But instead, the ICU practitioner and the respiratory therapist kept trying to force an oral airway into Talia's mouth, persisting in their unsuccessful attempts to ventilate her with a bag and mask for almost 10 minutes. You can't force air into an airway that is closed. As the two staff did the wrong thing, Jeff called out again, asking why the code team wasn't there. The ICU practitioner said she had called for it, but not when I ran for long help, rather when I had run for help, rather long wasted minutes after their futile attempts to get the oral airway in. A reasonable response time for a code blue within a hospital is less than two minutes. Although Talia was already in the ICU, it took an additional 10 minutes after her airway occluded for the code team, which included three doctors, to assemble in her room. Watching her oxygen levels drop precipitously on the monitor, Jeff knew what each subsequent minute without oxygen meant. Cerebral palsy, organic brain syndrome, irreparable brain damage, brain death and that a point of no return was upon Talia. I was tracking things more intuitively, just knowing it was crucial to get Talia oxygen. Waves of nausea kept washing over Jeff. He was like a caged animal, pacing beside Talia's bed, now telling the code team that Talia needed a crike. But the code team ignored him, focusing on establishing IV lines and not much else. No physician on the team suggested they do a crike, or question the doctor in charge of the code. Jeff screamed again, you have to do a crike now for Christ's sake. It's so, so weird what pops into your mind in a crisis like this. I found myself worrying of all things that Jeff had probably just offended the chaplain. And I remember watching myself think it, being aware of how bizarre it was to worry about offending a chaplain right now at that moment. Well, that same chaplain hovered on my shoulder, crowding me as I stood at the end of the bed with my hand on Talia's left foot. I wanted her to know we were still there even in the chaos of the code. I asked the chaplain to please give me space. To me, he symbolized death, like a priest there to issue last rites, and I couldn't bear to think of it. Get him away, I thought. Maybe I can keep death at bay, too. But Talia was dying. She had an obstructed airway and could not be ventilated. Patients with an acute respiratory arrest decline rapidly, within minutes sustaining irreversible damage to the brain and other organs, followed by cardiac arrest and death. If the patient's airway is obstructed and all attempts at ventilation fail, Resuscitation algorithms call for the code team to perform a cricothyrotomy quickly. Even the most basic life support courses teach that you need to assess the ABCs when confronted with an unconscious patient like Talia. Airway, breathing, circulation. Shockingly, the code team did not address either A, airway, or B, breathing. For almost 20 minutes, nobody effectively dealt with Talia's airway, and then she had a cardiac arrest. Now that they had created a C circulation problem, the team finally jumped into action by starting CPR. I put my face in my hands. My God, I thought, Talia's not going to make it. While Talia was receiving chest compressions, an anesthesiologist who had not been called to the code walked in took one look at her and said, she needs a crike. He called for the crike kit, which was still not at the bedside. Once the kit arrived, he quickly performed the procedure while other members of the code team were doing CPR. Within minutes, Talia's color improved and her heart was beating again, but she was completely unresponsive. 
I moved to the head of the bed. Leaning over Talia, I called out her name again and again, a desperate effort to bring her back from wherever she was. I just wanted her to know, I needed her to know, that I was right there. But there was no Talia left to hear me call her name, to feel our touch, to know we were with her. Later, we would learn that Talia was blind, deaf, paralyzed down her left side with a completely obliterated cortex. But in the minutes after the code, the doctor who supposedly ran it had the nerve to tell me cheerfully, ah, she'll be fine. She has a strong pulse, Look, her color is good. He then turned and walked out of the room and never saw Talia again. For nine long days after the code, while the doctors sorted out the extent of her brain injury, Talia and we remained in the neuro ICU with Talia comatose and riddled with seizures. Not only did we lose the Talia we knew, but we were now dependent for her care on the very people who had caused this situation in the first place. It was nearly untenable having to be so kind, decent, and polite to the perpetrators, but we had no choice because we still needed Talia to receive optimal medical care, and we needed her to be treated with dignity and kindness through this nightmare. So we held in check our feelings of rage and betrayal toward hospital personnel <coughs> while Talia was comatose on a bed in the ICU. As the days passed, we sang to Talia, held her tiny hand in ours, stroked her hair and soft skin, cuddled next to her, and wept. Test results confirmed that Talia's brain had been deprived of oxygen for so long that she sustained an irreversible anoxic brain injury. We met with all of Talia's doctors who came together in the same room for the very first time, and they informed us that she would not recover. This left us to make the decision about whether to leave Talia lifeless, but on life support, or to pull life support and allow her to die. We had the ventilator removed. We stayed with Talia for 37 grueling hours until her heart stopped again, and we will forever feel that we watched Talia die twice. The doctor who performed the autopsy concluded that Talia's airway had occluded due to swelling. By the time of the autopsy, that swelling had receded and the airway was open again. In other words, Talia's death was completely preventable. Talia didn't die because of equipment failure or because her surgeon's technical skills were lacking. She didn't die because she required an experimental procedure or some new medical technology that didn't yet exist. Talia died while those charged with her care were doing what they do every day. She died because her surgeon rushed through rounds so that he could get to the OR and on with his day. She died because the ICU team liked to do rounds standing in the doorway rather than at the bedside and including the patient and family. She died because her ICU doctor and her neurosurgeon didn't like to talk to one another, not about Talia nor about anything else. She died because the nurse never questioned the doctor's orders, even when she knew the patient and her family believed those orders were not addressing Talia's critical situation. She died because the speech therapist felt too intimidated to contact a physician directly or report her findings to Talia's medical team. She died because the respiratory therapist kept insisting Talia's breathing was not compromised and was trying to prove us wrong for suggesting otherwise. And then, he was too arrogant to acknowledge that Talia was in trouble or to call for help when he needed it. There were a dozen opportunities to save Talia's life. In each instance, the provider chose what worked best for them over the needs of their patient. I have a hard time even calling what happened to Talia errors. She died because her providers chose to disregard her. Listening saves lives, and we are living the reality that not listening can kill. It's scary when you think that every one of us will be a patient one day.
Communication failure is a common thread in all the interactions that led to Talia's death. The Joint Commission on Accreditation of Healthcare Organizations, more commonly referred to as JCO, describes communication error as the cause of 60 to 70 percent of preventable hospital deaths. Communication error, sorry, communication failure is that terrible gray area of medicine where a provider can walk away oblivious to the role they played in harming a patient. And communication breakdowns are not just between patients and providers. Even when hospital staff, and this includes doctors, become aware that something is not right or is about to go wrong, there's only a very small fraction, about 25%, who actually speak up about it. And interestingly, this is a problem throughout Western medicine, and studies in Canada and Western Europe have identified those same issues. Not speaking up can feel like a way to fly under the radar and avoid stirring up trouble, avoid conflict, but silence is not neutral. And studies confirm that silence causes catastrophic harm and death. Just think of Talia's nurse, the speech pathologist, the doctors. Talia died in the worst way, and while her kind of death will always be shocking, it shouldn't be surprising. An eye-opening paper from Johns Hopkins in 2016 estimated that over 250,000 patients die in American hospitals every year from medical error, making it the third leading cause of death in the United States prior to COVID. Over the past 20 years, deaths due to medical error have more than doubled. It's estimated that for every 100 patients admitted to the hospital, one will die due to medical error. Over the same 20 years, while, that was, while the death rate due to medical error was doubling, patient-centered care has become a kind of mantra, a standard that medical institutions almost universally claim they have adopted. But have they? Here, for example, is a screenshot from the website of the hospital where Talia died. And circled in red, you can see what they say about their commitment to patient-centered care. And I'll quote it, providing care that is respectful of and responsive to individual patient preferences, needs, and values, and ensuring that patient values guide all clinical decisions. And it goes on, our core values reflect the beliefs, behaviors, and assumptions of our hospital and are used as a moral guide in our day-to-day -day activities. They include principles that help employees provide compassionate, patient-centered care. Our core values are represented by the acronym SERVICE. Safety, we keep people safe. Excellence, we excel in every interaction. Respect, we consider others. Value, we improve quality. Integrity, we do the right thing. Compassion, we show that we care. Equality, we celebrate diversity. Unfortunately, in Talia's case, the patient-centered care that this hospital promoted was non-existent, and the consequences were ruinous. The question in the aftermath of such calamities becomes, what now? What is the ethical responsibility of those who cause harm to the patients and families that they hurt? The contractual nature of the doctor-patient relationship doesn't stop just because harm or an error has occurred. The providers in the hospital are still responsible to and for the patient and family. Patient-centered care should not end just because things didn't go as expected. In fact, we'd argue that medical institutions and providers have even more of an obligation to deliver patient-centered care after adverse events. Think about this for a moment. In the non-medical world, if a licensed certified technician shows up at your house to install your new oven, and messes up, and the wiring isn't right, and the power goes out in your whole house and shuts down, do they just leave? Never explaining what happened, never apologizing, never getting your power restored, never mind getting the oven installed and working. I mean, really, it's a ludicrous, it's a preposterous example. Yet, the equivalent response is happening in hospitals with patients every day. 
Denial is still a common response to this bizarre circumstance in which a hospital and providers fail to deliver, and then because of their own failings, they wash their hands of the patient, and that's it. But even in circumstances where the hospital discloses the error or the adverse event, the providers and hospitals are rarely thinking in terms of patient-centered care. Their goal is to close the file and be done as quickly as possible, rather than to meet the needs of the patient and family after the upheaval and anguish medical error creates. So what should patient-centered care after medical harm look like? Well, we're going to show you a short video clip that'll give you an idea what optimal patient-centered uh, an, an optimal patient-centered response to harm looks like. And this is not a staged video. It's from a webinar that we did with Jack and Teresa Gentry. And this clip is about the response of the providers and hospital system to a severe injury that occurred during spinal surgery that left Jack a quadriplegic. The, the big thing for me was that um, the organization, uh, MedStar Health, which is a large uh, Mid-Atlantic, probably the largest Mid-Atlantic health system, 10 hospitals, hundreds of outpatient centers, 30, 35,000 employees. Um, they came to me immediately and said, we're sorry, we just can't believe this happened, but we wanna do whatever we can do to support you in any way we can. And um, and they did. Um, you know, within hours of uh, of the uh, event, um, Dr. Torlani came in and sat down with Teresa and I and went over basically what happened and um, why it happened. And that um, even though it was an instrument malfunction, um, it happened in his operating room under his watch. And therefore, he was taking full and complete responsibility for everything that happened. And that he had talked to the administration at the corporate level and explained to them what had happened and that he was accepting responsibility. And they conveyed to him, who then conveyed to me that anything I needed um, would be taken care of. Um, and that was the same day that I woke up in the ICU. So it wasn't days later, one months later, it was within 24 hours. And that was the beginning of what uh, MedStar Health said to me and provided for me. And I'll just throw out there, uh, the doctor also, he had spoken with me from the OR. He came out as soon as surgery was over and spoke with me again and I could tell how difficult it was for him because he knew Jack as a prior patient. So it was very, very difficult for him to deal with this situation. And he was very upset by it. Um, I was feeling very overwhelmed with all kinds of different emotions <clears throat> between, you know, upset, what happened, what's gonna happen, what's, what's gonna be next, how am I gonna deal with this, all sorts of things like that. But, I always felt like there was support there from the beginning. One of the nurses came out from the OR, sat with me, kept me company until somebody else from my family was able to get there. So I feel like the hospital was behind us, under us, around us, really trying to take the responsibility, trying to talk with us and figure out what happened to the point where Dr. Tortolani, if I couldn't make it in as early as he did rounds in the morning, he would call me at home, give me updates. He called me when he found out what happened with the equipment. He called, so it was just this constant uh, being in touch and this constant communication. And honestly, from the beginning, it was very transparent. It was very open and made me feel comfortable in the setting we were in and that I was really a part of Jack's care. They used to joke and say, well, Teresa's really running the show here. I am a nurse um, and I had my spiral notebook because I had no idea about spinal cord injuries, et cetera. 
So I sat there every day taking notes, asking questions. They might be talking among themselves saying, when did this happen? I would look back at my book and say, well, it happened on this day at this, you know, different things. So there was a level of comfort that it gave us that we were being well cared for, that we were being given the information we needed and that that was gonna continue until we said, until we said Jack was better enough that we didn't need things anymore. What they described in the video is, is pretty obviously amazing, ethical, compassionate care after what was a terrible life-altering medical error. Patient-centered care must be about the patient and Jack and Teresa, by their own assessments, say they received exactly that. And frankly, what's disturbing about it is how surprised we all are by the care they received. We're shocked and stunned when a hospital does the right thing. So really what we need to figure out is how to package the kind of care that Jack and Teresa got and make it universal for all of you, all of us, all of everybody. How do we standardize what worked here and make sure that every patient gets that same kind of response? In order to mitigate the impact of medical harm, we first need to know what the experience means to those who are harmed and what kind of support they need over time. Only then can we make care after harm patient-centered for each patient and family. At Talia's Voice, the nonprofit we started after Talia died, Jeff and I spend much of our time working on exactly that through our work on communication and resolution programs, or CRPs. The goal of CRPs is to bring us closer to providing the kind of care that Jack and Teresa received. In fact, Talia's Voice is sponsoring a groundbreaking qualitative longitudinal research study in Talia's name on the patient and family experience of medical harm and CRPs. It's essential that we hear from patients and families about their experience of medical harm and how their needs change over time so that we can develop highly reliable, robust CRPs. There is a dearth of medical literature on the experience of medical harm from the patient and family perspective. And we can't make CRPs truly patient-centered until we have evidence-based information. Additionally, because of inequities that exist in the delivery of healthcare, this study is focusing on marginalized and vulnerable populations. In reality, there's nothing mysterious about the basic design of a communication and resolution program. CRPs are an excellent model of communication that hospitals can and should employ when harm or an unexpected outcome occurs in a medical setting, whether or not negligence was involved. CRPs involve a principled series of steps over time that hospitals take in the aftermath of an unexpected outcome and which hold the patient's and family's needs front and center while simultaneously making hospitals safer. CRPs matter because they insist organizations respond ethically and hold themselves accountable when things go wrong, that they act with compassion in discovering what patients and families need, and then commit to meeting those needs. They behave with integrity and transparency, keeping patients and families in the loop and involving them all the way through, including during an event review, and after that investigation, when the hospital makes changes based on the lessons learned from the investigation. CRPs require that hospitals treat patients and families with honesty, compassion, and dignity. And this isn't just a fantasy thing, like, oh, if we could do these, it would be great. You saw Jack and Teresa's situation. There are hospitals and medical institutions that are doing this. And there are some medical malpractice carriers that are requiring it of the hospitals that they insure. And significantly, a working group that is preparing an executive order for the president to sign within the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology just this month came out with a recommendation that the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS, within five years should 
should require CRPs in cases of patient harm as a condition of participation in Medicare and Medicaid at all hospitals. In other words, federal agencies may soon make CRPs a requirement for all hospitals. When Talia died, we had no CRP. The hospital and providers didn't acknowledge their culpability or apologize for Talia's death and still have not done so. Their complete and utter silence is both typical and terribly damaging. We refer to it as a second harm. The first harm occurred uh, when Talia died due to their errors. But this second harm is ongoing and intentional. They are purposely silent. And through that silence, the hospital and providers leave us to pick up the pieces of the mess they created. Their silence still reverberates for each of us. It's been nine years, and still I live in a liminal space that can best be likened to a pot of water simmering, ready to boil over. My patience becomes impatience. My anger, rage, I'm sad, and then I'm sobbing. It all happens in an instant. I can be following a conversation, and then I'm not. I can be sleeping peacefully and then be bolt upright in bed gasping for air like Talia did, or far too often soaking the bed in a night sweat that seems to come out of nowhere. The errors and the negligence that contributed to Talia's death torment me. In my mind, I still spend part of every day in Talia's room in the ICU replaying these scenes over and over. For many years, every day, as these scenes unfolded, there would be this moment where Talia is right there to be saved, and it's so clear what each person needs to do, and then they don't, and Talia slips through my fingers again. Clearly, some part of me believed there could be a different outcome, yet there never was. <clears throat> now, any hope of that has disappeared, but I still end up back in that room. Only now I know exactly how it's going to end. Talia will slip through my fingers again, and I'm just left to watch. In horror, knowing what's coming, and powerless to change it. Like many who experience unexpected traumatic loss, I am hypervigilant to a fault. Bad things happen when we least expect it, so I am ever alert to potential danger. Intellectually, I know that control is an illusion. I cannot prevent terrible things from occurring. Yet without intending to, I find myself tracking way too many things, like where all my adult children are at any given moment, as though doing so will alert me to pending danger, presumably so that I can prevent it. But I'm also hypervigilant in another way. Many of you may have had the experience of going to sleep and waking in the morning, having forgotten for a brief window that someone you love is dead. Then with a jolt, reality hits and you feel bereft all over again, realizing that this person is actually gone. Well, some part of me is always on guard, making sure that I am never going to be that person. Forgetting, even for the briefest period, necessarily means remembering. Re-experiencing Talia's demise is more than I can handle. So I carry the fact of Talia's death front and center at all times. The worst part is that I remain hypervigilant all night, too. I never get restorative sleep, since letting myself fall into that kind of deep sleep requires letting go. Sleep studies show hundreds of rousings in a five-hour window. We are not the same people we once were. And our kids? They lost both a sister and the parents we used to be and have their own traumatic experiences to wade through. Medical harm is not an event that you get over. The repercussions of serious harm are lifelong, multi-generational, exhausting. It's been nine years, and we are still reeling from this nightmare. It's true that even with a CRP, Talia would still be dead. There's no bringing her back, no turning back the clock for a redo on care that was disastrous. 
But we shouldn't carry this burden alone. We will always have a relationship with the hospital and providers involved. Their silence does not change the fact that we share Talia's death between us, and that is no small thing. A communication and resolution program would have helped the hospital and providers keep their focus patient-centered on us and our needs by owning the truth outright and then tending to us in the aftermath of Talia's death. This would have been a better alternative for us, for Talia's providers, and ultimately, all future patients who walk innocently through the doors of that hospital, just as an unwitting Talia did not so very long ago. We hope that in hearing Talia's and our story tonight, really listening to what we've shared, that you will feel motivated to push for actual patient-centered care in the spheres in which you move. And whether that's speaking up when you know something worrisome or dangerous or unethical is occurring or about to happen, pushing administrators to adopt CRPs to better mitigate the impact of medical harm, joining committees that are working to solve any of the issues we've raised, or simply writing letters or volunteering in an effort to bring about change. We want you to know that every harm patient or family member with whom we work will be grateful because they, like us, are only doing this work to make sure that what happened to them never happens to anyone else. Thank you for listening tonight.